The DC Independent Film Festival was launched in 1999 to nurture independent film. As a competitive festival, all films are Washington, D.C. premieres, and many are U.S. and world premieres. This year's festival takes place March 4th through the 13th, and I have some of the filmmakers joining me to talk about their films. I'll talk with Russell Max Simon about his web series, District Land, writer and star of The Visit, Vishwas, to will talk about his short that analyzed our preconceived notions on certain ethnic communities, and writer-director of Kara Deepin Zinzuvadia will talk about his feature-length espionage thriller. And that's all ahead on Picture Lock. everybody, this is Kevin Sampson of Picture Lock. On the line with me right now, I have Russell Max Simon. He's the writer and producer of District Land. Russell, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. No problem. So, uh, District Land is going to be playing at DC Independent Film Festival uh, opening night, correct? Opening night, March 4th, that's right. All right, can you give us a, give the audience a description of what District Land is all about? District Land is about five young people living in D.C. It's uh, it's like shows that young people, but it's, it's set right here in the district. So it shows that side of the city that you don't see in all those other shows that are about D.C. House of Cards. You know, it's um, it's a D.C. show, but it's about the young people, not the president or the vice president. Yeah, I, and I find I find that interesting. Um, how did you come up with that idea? <laughs> well, you know, it is based off of a play by Christina Bejan. The play was at Capital Fringe Festival in 2014. And when I first heard a table read of the play, I thought, you know, that Christina had really put her finger on something that I had never seen on TV before. You know, like I said, all the shows about D.C. are basically about, you know, Congress or the president. And I thought D.C. was more interesting than that. You know, I thought it was interesting that a lot of young people come here from around the country and, uh, you know, try to make a change or try to do something with their lives or their careers. And they're growing up and doing all those sorts of things that young people do growing up. But they're also going to work on the Hill and going to work at prestigious think tanks and all the rest of it. So I always thought that that was a very interesting part of D.C. that I hadn't seen anywhere before. And when I saw Christina's play... Uh, I was very interested in it. So the show is based off of her play. Okay. Um, and right now it's a pilot for um, a web series, correct? Yeah, we made the pilot episode and we have five more episodes written. And the idea is to uh, you know, get funding to keep making the show and keep telling the stories about these people. One of the things that I find uh, interesting about web series and just online media in general is, you know, you have that binge factor. But one of the things you have to do is you have to uh, develop the characters quickly. And I think um, with your characters, you can, right off the bat, you know who is who, uh, um, what kind of makes up their personality. So could you talk a little bit about writing those characters and even your actresses, because I think they do a great job. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I think they're all fantastic actors, and I'm, I was super happy with the people I was able to bring in. But yeah, TV is, you know, they say movies are all about story, and TV is really about the characters. If you don't like them or, or want to see what happens to them uh, more especially, then you won't keep watching. So it's, I think it's a, a good cross-section of what you'll see in sort of the young DC professional world. The main character is Maria. She's this Cuban-American, first-generation um, Rhodes Scholar who works at a think tank. And the first episode is really about you know her life plan, which she has very structured and, and thought out, uh, beginning to crumble. You want to hear about the other characters too? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. <laughs> the uh, you know Catherine. Um, we got someone who works at a think at a. At a uh, a consulting firm called Cruz Ashton Minnick, a, a fictional consulting firm, real ass kicker type A. 
Uh, Dave, uh, played by Brendan Wedner, is an unemployed Georgetown law grad. Uh, you know, sleeps in a lot, uh, plays the Tinder game a lot, uh, but also organizes uh, something called the Progressive Leadership Network, and that mostly consists of a bunch of DC happy hours. Uh, you got uh, Charity, who's played by Kaylin Dickinson, and she uh, she's sort of a nonprofit. You know, they might call her a wage drone. Not not the happiest in her job in the world, but uh, she also organizes the Poetry Slam that is the big uh, last scene of the pilot episode. And finally, you've got um, Frank, who's actually the only one who works on the Hill. Uh, those are the five housemates. And then there's a sixth character, uh, Aisha, who's played by Robin Freeman, who you'll see doing the slam poetry in the, uh, in the trailer, which a lot of people have seen. And she's a DC native and um, comes into a few of the different housemates' lives and challenges them on a number of things. Yeah, so I think one of the things about the series, it's obvious that um, uh, it's no small production, right? You have so many extras, uh, whether they're in the bars. I really liked the different locations and settings um, that are definitely around in DC. Um, making it feel really real, um, like you're there with the group. So, uh, as you said, you know, you're trying to raise money for um, to, to to shoot more. You already have some written. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what it takes to produce a show like District Land? Yeah, this was quite a production. You know, we had 50, 60 extras all together, um, a crew of about 10 or 12 people. We had a, uh, an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign to pay for part of it and some producers, including myself, who paid for the other part of it. So it's not an easy or a cheap production, but we did have, as you said, some really great locations. We, we shot at the Coop in Columbia Heights, and the owner there was very, very gracious, allowing us to shoot there. We also shot at Clyde's, our restaurant, the one in Gallery Place, Chinatown. Um, the manager there was very gracious. So... As the show goes on and as we do more episodes, what I'm hoping is that, you know, the business community of D.C. will, will jump on this as an opportunity to, to show the city in a, in a way that it, it hasn't been shown anywhere else. Maybe come help us with locations, help us with sponsorships and that sort of thing. It is quite a big production. It's not just, you know, a guy on a camera following people around the street. So um, it, it, a lot went into it. Yeah, most definitely. Um so folks at home, <laughs> you definitely want to support District Land, uh, make this thing happen. Again, DC is more than, as Russell said, uh, just the president or uh, government. All right, so uh, Russell, one of the things I think uh, in regard to actually exhibiting your work, DC Independent Film Festival, what does that mean to you to have uh, the film selected and, and playing opening night? That's pretty awesome. Yeah, DCFF has been great. Um, they have been around for a long time, and they have put together a really extraordinary premiere event for opening night. Um, you know, the executive director, uh, Deirdre Pritchett, wants to support uh, local filmmakers, and, and I'm one of them that she's said, you know, let's get behind Russell's show. And, uh, and the event that they're putting on is fantastic. The band whose music is featured in the show is going to play a set there. Nice. So everyone will get to hear these quiet colors play. You'll get to see the pilot episode, and, and then you'll get to see a reading from an upcoming episode with all the actors and a Q and A. So, and it's an eastern it's an eastern market at uh, Miracle Theater, which is a beautiful, beautiful theater. I was just visiting the other day, so I'm really ha happy they're, they're working with us on it. Wow, I mean that sounds that sounds awesome. Uh, I mean, you're not only going to be able to see. Uh, the series, but to be able to hear the readings and everything. I mean, I think that's definitely something that we should get behind and support. All right, Russell, yeah. how can people actually see the pilot? Well, right now, the only way to see the pilot is to come to the premiere event on March 4th. So if you go on DC uh, Independent Film Festival's website, uh, you'll see that you can buy tickets there. After that, it'll show at a couple other festivals and, uh, you know, hopefully eventually it will be released. Um, but right now, if you want to see it, Come, come visit us at the premiere March 4th. Nice. Always the producer. You want to <laughs> see it. <laughs> but, but no, uh, it, it gets a picture lock, a uh, cosign, um, definitely an interesting. And I think what I, what I enjoyed about it most is that it does what a web series should do. It introduces the characters, but I felt like I wanted to see more. 
I, I knew it wasn't over, obviously, but it was kind of like, ah, oh, I, I wouldn't mind investing some time actually seeing these characters develop. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Russell, well, thanks for your time. Good luck at the festival and good luck with the pilot. Thanks, Kevin. Good talking to you again. As always. All right, take care. I'm Justin Escovel, co-creator of the Epic Film Guys, and you're watching Picture Lock. Let's keep it real. 9-11 scarred our world and is a date that everyone in America can recall where they were and what they were doing when the Twin Towers were hit. Race and religion in the States has always been a touchy subject, and I think it would be fair to say that the way we look collectively at the Islamic world was changed or intensified for some due to the aftermath of that fateful day. My next guest explores how we interact with one another in the short The Visit, which is playing at the DC Independent Film Festival. Vishwash, welcome to Picture Lock. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. No problem. It's my pleasure. All right, I always love to start at the beginning. When did you first fall in love with film? Uh, as far as I can remember, so I grew up in India, and uh, um, India, as you know, has a huge film culture. Bollywood, you know, is all pervasive and everywhere. And um, always wanted to be an actor, filmmaker, as far as I can recall. So um, I would say about 38 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a particular film or anything that you were just like, oh, wow, I, I really love this, I got to do this? Uh, less about a film, more about um, the actors themselves, especially one um, actor. Uh, he's probably the biggest actor we've ever had in Indian cinema, and probably there'll never be anyone like him again. His name is Amitabh Bachchan. He has spoiled many uh, young men and, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, goaded them to become actors. So it was more about him and the stature that he reached, uh, reached and the kind of stuff that he did on screen, and less about one film in particular, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, so you wrote, uh, acted, and produced uh, in The Visit. Um, in terms of acting and the craft of acting, what, I what is it that you enjoy about that? I just, I don't know, I, you know, um, I just love it. I just enjoy it. It gives me a high that I just cannot explain, to be very honest with you. Um, um, it's just, just to, be, to, be, to be able to um, tell a story, to be able to become a character using your emotions, using your body, using yourself is something that just, you know, I guess um, I've always enjoyed, I've always loved. It's hard for me to explain what I love about it, but I do love, you know, uh, it a lot. It's just that thing that's burning inside you. Yes, I get it. Yes, I, yes, yes, yes. I totally get it. All right, so if you can give the audience uh, a quick description of what The Visit is all about. So The Visit is um, the way uh, we like to talk about it. It's like sort of like an upside-down look at the uh, present-day racial realities, like you said in your uh, introduction. Um, so um, we all know the world that we live in. We all know uh, the stereotypes that are there. Um, everybody has stereotypes. Everybody has certain ways of looking at, you know, everyone else. And um, me being sort of like a, what I like to call like a generic brown man living in the <laughs> world that I live in, kind of live up to some of, some of those stereotypes. And if I grow a beard, then those stereotypes get magnified. Mm -hmm. So, and I've always found it a little bit, um, you know, of course there's a dark element to it, but it, it's also kind of weird and funny in, 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 in a way that, mm. And uh, I just kind of, so, so, so this film talks about, 11, in 11 minutes creates a situation in which certain people are influenced by those stereotypes directly or indirectly and they act and react in a certain way. So yeah. we don't try to solve any problems, we're not trying to you know, uh, provide a solution. Our goal was just to you know, show a situation that could very much happen in present day America and then just force people to think as to how would they react in that and who's right and who's wrong you know, and right. who's actually on you know, uh, on, on what side. So that's, that, that was the attempt. Right, so, uh, and, and I want to dive into that uh, as well, but what inspired you to write it? Is it just the fact that, like you said, as a, a generic brown man, every day the different uh, situations that you find yourself in, and so kind of life inspired the art? Yeah, so um, the desire to create something first of all it came out of the fact that you know I'm, I'm basically an actor and I'm trying to write interesting parts for myself because no one else would you know? <laughs> so uh, and why this piece in general I think because it kind of just came natural to me like you said um, you, you observe things and you you know see things and they kind of register themselves in, in your inner subconscious and actually um, in reality there were two separate incidents that happened to me nothing at all as dramatic or as bizarre as what's in the film mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but enough for me to go, oh, you know, what if these two things happen together and what if someone did X, Y, Z, what yeah. would that mean, you know? Yeah. So it was a little bit of life imitating art, as you said. Yeah. You know, what I found interesting in watching it, I was like, oh my goodness, this <laughs> is just brilliant. And let me tell you why. Because the way that you approached it is... Uh, as the, I'm going to say the generic brand. What's your sure. character's name? Let's call him that. There's no name. There's no name in there. Uh, even in the IMDb, we call it the bearded man. Okay. Yeah. So that's the whole point as to, you know, a lot of people don't even know who's from where and what's what. You just see a generic brown man in a beard and you're like, poop, 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 poop. Right. That's why we didn't want to give the guy a name or an ethnicity in particular. Right. You know, he's just, he's just a generic brown man. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, okay. So for the bearded man, yeah. um, I loved how instead of uh, from... Uh, I guess an outside perspective telling this story, it's the bearded man that embraces the stereotype to help himself in a certain situation. Yep. And to me, I thought that was amazing because one, like you're, you're like, okay, what's really going on here? But two, um, it just says so much in regard to the fact of kind of our preconceived notions. Um, so I, I don't know. I just thought that, that I thought that that was really smart because instead of um, coming from maybe an outside perspective, this was coming more from an interior perspective. Yes, sure. So yeah, yeah. So um, do you feel that this is an issue that needs to be addressed? Yes, absolutely. Um, but you know. Um, yeah, like I said, like we're all human. We react to situations. We uh, react to things that have happened in the past to us or to people around us or to society in general. And we form preconceived no notions and we compare everything, what's happening right now with what's happened in the past and relatively make decisions and we, we, we act. So um, I definitely think, you know, it, it is something that needs to be addressed because, of course, you know, at the macro level, at a 10, 50,000 foot level, there are powers and there are people and there are situations that are at play which are beyond you know anyone's control when it comes to everyday life like people like you and me but they impact us and they impact the way we act and the way we react so um, I think all we can do is m if we are ourselves faced with certain situations like the one depicted in the film you know we can if we can think before we react and we choose to respond I think that's something that we can do on a on 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 an individual basis mm -hmm. and that's all we can hope for because I don't think you and I or you know we could solve all these problems with a clean you know brush <laughs> or something like that right and that's why you know I wrote this and that's why uh, we left it the way we left it is so if somebody watches it and if they get into it it can force them to think oh so who's right who's wrong mm -hmm. what would I do and you know uh, is what he did right or is what he did wrong what yeah. should he do next you know and hopefully they'll start that internal dialogue so if 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 you or someone else is faced with that situation, you can at least sort of you know think and pause and you know just think before you react to something like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, I'm talking with Vishwas, the writer and star of The Visit, which is playing at DC Independent Film Festival. Um, it's definitely a conversation starter. You said this is like one of your first uh, productions that you yes. actually produced, right? Um, just let's just talk about uh, producing it. Sure. Um, how long did it take to shoot the film? The actual uh, shooting was over two days on March 7th and 8th. Um, we sh so we just moved here, me and my family, we just moved here to the D.C. area two, two, about two months ago. Okay. I lived in New Jersey, so we shot uh, over a weekend, March 7th and 8th, uh, two locations. The indoor scene is actually in one of the rooms in our house, and the outdoor scene was in a gas station, which one of my uh, friends worked at, so we were able to <laughs> get that. So two days, yeah, okay. the actual shooting. All right, and then in terms of the actors that are uh, acting with you, uh, where did you find them? They, they, they were great as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we really got really lucky with the casting, and um, uh, we they're all New York, folks from New York. Um, Amr, who plays Wasim, um, he, he actually has family in D.C. He used to live in D.C. as well. Um, so we auditioned actors. We posted a casting notice on uh, Actors Access, and people came out and auditioned. And that's how we found all of our actors. And mm. in true Hollywood um, um, tradition, when it came to hiring an all-American Caucasian man, we went with an Australian. So, <laughs> <laughs> so David nice. Harris. David Harris is he's he's actually from Australia, but you can't tell because he's that good of an actor. Yeah. Uh, and Ari um, and Anthony and Edward, who were also the three attackers, also we auditioned them. Um, 
and found them all in New York. Awesome. All right, so uh, what are your plans for the future? Do you have anything else that you're writing right now? And Yes, so uh, since the visit, I have written three more shorts, and there is one that um, I am particularly excited about, uh, me and my uh, production partner, who is also the executive producer on this, uh, Manav, we are in pre-production on that one, so hopefully we'll be shooting that again uh, soon, sometime soon. Awesome. All right, so uh, if people want to reach out to you or people want to see the visit, obviously they can go to DC Independent Film Festival uh, next weekend to be able to see yes. it. Uh, when it's playing on Sunday. Uh, it's playing on Saturday, March 12th Saturday? at okay. 1 10 p.m. In, um, in a block of shorts called Seriously Funny and uh, at the Naval Heritage Seriously Center. Seriously Funny? It's it's not that funny. I guess the dark comedy. Okay, being, uh, being okay. Yeah, it's definitely not, you know, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> right. hilarious, you know, but it's, uh, but it's um, I guess, the, the dark comedy element of it, which qualified it for that uh, block. Awesome. And you said you're new to the area. If people want to reach out to you, acting, things like that, how can they do that? Uh, I guess the best way would be um, my website, meetbishwas.com, M-E-E-T-V-I-S-H-W-A-S. That has all of my information, more than you would want to know, but it also has my uh, contact information. And I would love to collaborate with people, and hopefully people will reach out and do it for my All right. My man, create some magic, <laughs> Vishwas. Thanks for coming on Picture Lock, Thank man. you for having me. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I'm Devin Gallagher, host of Media on the Radio, and you're watching Picture Lock. When you think of D.C., you certainly think politics. Cinematically, military, government, and espionage films certainly have had their link to the nation's capital. My next guest takes us on a journey with a young woman named Kara who moves to D.C. for grad school and meets and falls for a lobbyist named David. Except Kara's a spy and David's her target. Kara will be playing at the D.C. Independent Film Festival Sunday, March 6th. I have the film's director in studio with me now, Deepin Zinzuvadia. My bad. That's Welcome hard. to the show. Yeah, good I told yeah. you I was going to try to. No, I was going to try to nail great. it, and then yeah. oh, it's better oh. than most people do. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. So I like starting at the beginning. Mm. When did you first fall in love with film? Oh gosh, um, fell in love with film probably when I was three and I saw Grease in the theater. You know? Really, Greece? Yeah, Greece, yeah. <laughs> what about Greece? Wow, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I what about asleep. Greece made you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's probably my earliest memory of film, you know. And then, pretty much growing up until I was a teenager, watched a lot of H Hindi movies, Bollywood films. Mm. You know, I didn't speak a lick of Hindi, but you know, it was the stuff that was on that my parents were watching all the time. So, you know, I don't know if you know who Amitabh Bachchan is, but he was my hero growing up. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't. The I gotta big get, B. Yeah. I got to get my Bollywood He was in game Gatsby. Up. Okay. Yeah, with Leo. So, you know, it's probably his crossover role. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, this is a feature film. Yeah. Uh, this is your first feature, correct? First feature, yeah. All right. So what gave you the genesis for this idea? Because this is, this is kind <coughs> of a big idea for your first feature. Yeah, so... Oh, well, um, first, maybe give a description to the audience about what it's all about. So. Yeah, I mean, the, what you um, stated was exactly what it's about. You know, it's about a girl who moves to D.C. And, um, you know, from the get-go, from the first scene of the movie, we know she's a spy. And um, she meets a guy that she falls in uh, like with, <laughs> you know, and I'd say in love with. Uh, she falls in like with, and you know she's really gaming him. Um, she's um, spying on him. She's trying to get information from uh, him, and you know that's that's what it's about. And how this idea came about is, um, you know, I was living in California for a couple of years. I was here, and then I moved up to California to kind of get into the whole film industry. And mm. you know, after a couple of years there, I was like, you know, I, I want to make a movie, not really necessarily be a part of Hollywood mm. or try to you know climb those walls, get into the studios. Right. And I came back and um, I started thinking of different ideas. And, you know, a the Anna Chapman story, you know, she mm -hmm. was that spy mm -hmm. that got caught. Uh, ten of them were caught. Four of them were right here in this area, literally in this area of <laughs> right. Arlington, Clarendon. And, you know, they were spies that were, you know, not jumping off of overpasses onto a car like, you know, Angelina and Salt or or not drinking martinis, you know, shaking or stirred, nothing like that. They're right. just spies that were here living a normal life and collecting um, information. 
they're they're what you call intelligencers, mm. and that was actually the original title of the movie. And um, then it kind of evolved into you know a female character, and yeah. evolved into the name that it is today, which is just Kara. So and you wrote the the screenplay? I wrote it as well. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's just talk about that writing a strong female lead. What what did you just just write a strong lead, or did you uh, intentionally think I want to do a strong female lead? You know, it it evolved into that. You know, I mean what what it is now as opposed to what it started as is so different you know it mm -hmm. went through so many edits and rewrites and it didn't necessarily start as a female lead um it was just you know as as you progress with the writing and it becomes something you know you just look at it from different angles you kind of you know set it aside and you say what if you know Kara's an alien <laughs> you know and you throw it out to the universe like that and something different comes back you know and um, you know, it just kind of evolved into, you know, a female role and, you know, really what it is today. It didn't necessarily start with a female uh, lead. Okay. And, yeah. and how long did it take uh, just to shoot and edit and all that good stuff? Uh, to shoot, um, we spent about 20 days. Uh, yeah, I took two weeks off of my wow. regular job. And, nice. And, yeah. So we I'm shot. talking about getting yeah. it done. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So, yeah, my wife didn't get a vacation that year. Oh, <laughs> She got to take care of the kids, though. Hey, right, right. <laughs> hey but you're at DC Independent Film Festival, exactly. so I yeah, guess it was yeah, worth it. Exactly, right, right. right. um, yeah, so spent, you know, those two weeks shooting it, a few days here and there, and um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then editing it took a lot longer than I expected, you know. Um, I really, you know, not to brag or, you know, talk great about myself, but I really did a, uh, a detailed, good job of pre-production, and getting everything ready for production. <laughs> and I was like, okay, once I have it all in the can, I'm gonna do editing and this and that. And that, that was a really big challenge, you know, yeah. to find the right editor to, to, it's just overwhelming. You have so much footage and data and, you know, you're just trying to put it all together. And, you know, I could have planned that better. And I think next time I'm gonna know, you know, I, I know f the whole process from beginning to end all the way to now sitting right. here you know doing this and right. marketing and festivals you know those are things that I kind of put out of my mind for a long time mm -hmm. I didn't go to festivals I didn't explore festivals or any of that stuff you know I just kind of was like I'm gonna move back here I'm not gonna work on anybody else's film I'm not gonna do shorts no music videos none of that stuff I just want to do my feature that's what my end goal is and that's what I just focused on and, you know, I got to focus more on, you know, the post-production side of things. So it took me, you know, quite a while to do post-production. Less awesome. than a year, but, you know, I could have done it, you know, more efficiently and better. And you know better. what? Uh, you are watching or listening to Picture Lock. I am talking with Deepin about his first feature, Kara. What a humble guy. I appreciate um, you actually putting it out there that, you know, that, that that is what it is. Hey, at least you got it in the can. Yeah. And, and you're right. I think, uh, especially as an independent filmmaker, you do have to think about the entire package. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, look, you're here now. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about your lead actress. Um, what's her name? And uh, she, she did a, a pretty good job in terms of... Uh, you know, carrying the different weights on her shoulders that she has within the Yeah, world. no, I think she did a great job. Her name is Davin Ralston. Um, she is from Richmond, and she lives in the city. And um, uh, she's a theater actress, and, you know, she was almost about to miss the premiere because she <laughs> was going to be in a show, as, you know, a lot of the actors had that conflict. But, um, yeah, you know, I think she did a great job. Um, I auditioned. Uh, many people for all the roles there's a lot of roles in the film but for that one in particular I auditioned maybe about four or five and there was just something I really liked about her you know not only for the role but I just felt like got along with her from you know the get-go and I mm -hmm. felt like you know I was able to work from her in the audition I mean, work with her in the audition you know and that's the thing not everybody brings exactly what you expect when you're auditioning them or hiring them to work with you, but right. it's really about are they able to work with you and bend and you know give ideas and argue with you and still be <laughs> respectable about it and you know and I, f I felt that she had all that and I I was really glad I went with her. Nice. Did she yeah. cut her hair for the the? No, movie she didn't. It was already. Uh, yeah, yeah. She was. It was already like that and you know it was something I had thought about and I was like, do I want that? And I was like, hmm, maybe. 
uh, we'll put a scene in there where we're shaving her head and this is why she has short hair because right. I don't know you've seen it so you know she has the lice you know <laughs> as she came from Russia and her flashbacks right. <laughs> yeah, so we yeah, try yeah. to like you know try to put that in there without actually shaving it so we <laughs> kind of cut right when we started with the clippers on All the right. wig yeah well you <laughs> talked a about it a little bit um, you know you're going to be playing at DC Independent Film Festival um, can you let us know what date and time it's going to be showing and then also what you're going to be doing with the film after um, so it's going to be March 6th at the DC Independent Film Festival it's going to be at the Carnegie Institution for Science uh, it's going to be at 1245 is the showing and then immediately after that they're going to have a bar a cash bar for an hour and a Q&A um, along with that. Nice. And my plans for after this, I have some other festivals. This is still early on in the festival season, mm -hmm. so um, uh, I'm gonna see what happens with other festivals. And I'm starting to look into you know different VOD options, uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix and iTunes and you know there's so many options yeah. out there. There's even small distribution markets that a lot of uh, films from uh, some of the relatively smaller film festivals you know get picked up for and you know they get distribution so yeah a lot of its hope and it'll, and the other side of it is just keep pushing on with marketing myself and doing stuff like this and getting in festivals so you know, awesome you know. all right Demon. so if uh people want to get in contact with you or check out the film how can they do that um well, I have a Facebook page, um, very anti-social <laughs> media. <laughs> I shouldn't be, but I started a Facebook page, so it's facebook.com uh, slash chosen films. Okay. Um, and you can see information for it there. Awesome. And yeah. you spell chosen differently, right? C-H-O-Z-I-N films, yeah. All right. You know, Deepin, you, you inspired me through this conversation, <laughs> man. No, seriously. You said, I'm going to move back, and yeah. all I'm going to do is shoot my feature film. That's all I wanted to do. And you did it. Yeah. Congratulations, my Thank man. You Thanks so for much. coming on the show. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oops. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll be right back for the wrap up. Hi, I'm Ulysses Campbell, the producer of Fantastic Forum, and you're watching Picture Lock. That's all for this episode. I'd like to thank my guests, Russell Max Simon Vishwas and Deepin Zinzavadia for coming on the show. Make sure you check out their work at the DC Independent Film Festival, which runs March 4th through 16th. Find out more info and purchase tickets for the festival at dciff-indy.org. You can find Picture Lock on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. Don't forget to check out the website, picturelockshow.com, for movie reviews, news, and if you're interested in being a guest on the show. Until next time, I hope you stay locked on film.